defending ESG, environmental, social, and governance practices across the entire supply chain. Topic of my conversation today with Brandon Owens. He is Vice President of Sustainability with Insight Sourcing Group. Hi, Brandon. Hi, Robert. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, thanks for being with me as well. So describe for me, if you can, what is the challenge that companies face today in meeting ESG goals throughout the extended supply chain, specifically with regard to so-called scope three emissions? Right. When you're looking at scope three emissions, the, the biggest challenge is really data and transparency. Um, just trying to get a handle on you know what's out there, uh, what's the footprint of different suppliers, how do you measure that? Uh, a lot of organizations are in uh, different parts of the sustainability journey, and sometimes you just don't even have the data infrastructure in place to, to understand what the current footprint is. Mm -hmm. So when people talk about their carbon footprint or companies talk about their carbon footprint today, they're not necessarily including this so-called scope three, which of course are emissions that are come from parties outside your organization. That is your third parties, your vendors and things like that, that are not within your direct control, but they don't have visibility of that right now to a large extent. Um, to a large extent, some organizations have made uh, incredible gains in trying to quantify that, but you know, it's complicated. Uh, they start with scope one, uh, which is the emissions that they control on site energy use. Scope two, emissions from things like energy procurement. Uh, that's easier to get a handle on. Uh, then you move into scope three, and you know, that's where it gets really challenging because of the, the, the data problems and the transparency issues that I mentioned. Yeah, it still seems like it's a work in progress for so many companies today, even scope two. I mean, well, let's talk about that for a moment. How can companies actually procure renewable energy? And for that matter, if they, everybody does it, is there enough, enough of it to go around on a global basis? Yeah, well, let me hit that in, in two parts. So in terms of procurement, uh, there are a lot of options uh, out there today. Uh, many utilities offer green pricing programs. Uh, and so organizations can actually just switch over uh, their rates and their tariffs uh, to select a green option. There are on-site options. Organizations can actually develop on-site solar. Uh, there are off-site options. Uh, there's something called a virtual uh, power purchase agreement, which has become popular. Uh, there's community solar. So there are a whole range uh, of ways that organize, organizations can participate in purchase renewable energy. Tell me more about this virtual power purchase agreement. Is that a standard thing now or how is that developing and what does it consist of? It, it's becoming standard. It's basically a swap agreement, um, a financial agreement to purchase renewable energy. Um, there are platforms to connect sort of buyers and sellers and engage in those contracts. So it's something that's becoming increasingly power, uh, increasingly used uh, and popular. Of course, it depends on where you're buying, what you're buying the energy for, whether you're a factory or whether you've got a fleet of transportation equipment, and in which case in the latter, I think it probably is much more difficult to find renewable energy today, even as, even as we are going toward electric vehicles, we're certainly not there yet totally, right? Yeah, there is a lot going on the transportation side, but that's definitely different from uh, what's happening with electricity procurement. Uh, but let me just get back to your, your previous question real quick on whether there is enough renewable uh, energy globally. The answer is yes. Uh, it's actually the fastest growing source of electricity in the world, uh, and it has outpaced uh, fossil fuels uh, the last several years. So there's a lot of it. Uh, we just can't bring it on fast enough. Uh, there are some local challenges with the grid interconnection and permitting and things like that uh, that need to be worked through. But uh, there's plenty of renewables out there. And when we talk about that, are we largely talking about solar or are there other forms of energy um, as well? Solar and wind power, uh, that's about two thirds uh, of the new capacity coming online. Those are kind of the big two in the renewable space. But there are others that, you know, there's, of course, conventional hydropower, geothermal, uh, biopower. Uh, those are in the mix as well. So up to now, so many companies have been making their decisions on select, selecting suppliers solely on the basis of cost and maybe product quality and things like that too, but certainly not necessarily taking into account the supplier's carbon footprint. And here we are back again to scope three. How can companies make their procurement decisions? How can they incorporate that consideration into their procurement decisions? Yeah, good question. And that's where it starts to get interesting. So in terms of evaluating scope three emissions and then starting to um, uh, decarbonize that supply chain, there's a process. Uh, once you have that data, um, you really need to understand uh, a little more clearly 
um, what your supplier's carbon footprint is. Um, so you need to add additional data to, to get the full picture. Once you have that, uh, then you need some sort of platform uh, and an approach to decision-making that incorporates carbon into the mix along with cost. Uh, so you're talking about a, a whole sort of system of creating transparency, understanding where the different suppliers stand in the stack, and then having a, a decision-making framework that allows you to look at both of those dimensions, both carbon and cost. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a few examples of this happening, uh, but we're really early days uh, in terms of sort of creating the structure that will allow organizations to make trade-offs between suppliers based on carbon footprint. As in all cases and all aspects of ESG, which includes, of course, the way that workers are treated in factories and the like, there's always a question of where you're getting your data from your suppliers. Is it coming directly from them? Are they self-reporting? Are there other ways to find it? How, are you, how can you validate this data to make sure that it's accurate uh, when, when you do measure your suppliers' uh, emissions? Yeah, that's, that's part of the challenge too. Some of it does come from the suppliers um, and, and a lot of them are very transparent uh, and straightforward. And so you can get a lot of information there, but you do need to validate it uh, externally against other data sources and also do some calculations. And so, you know, suppliers have a certain uh, geographic footprint. Um, they're in a certain business. So you can understand what their electricity demands are, things like that. And so there are ways of kind of doing the math and coming up with a, a pretty good assessment of, of where they stand. Uh, but it does start with data that they provide directly. Even if they're thousands of miles away, as in the case with so many offshore manufacturing supply chains, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, you, you know where they are. You know uh, what their manufacturing capacity is. Uh, you know what their business is. And so you can make assumptions uh, to get you, you know, part, part of the way there in terms of really understanding the carbon footprint. And what happens when you're facing a multi-tier supply chain, which of course is just about all manufacturing supply chains. You're talking about sub-tiers, sub-suppliers. How do you get visibility of that going all the way up? Do you rely on your tier one supplier to provide that with for you? Or do you go up yourself to tier one, tier two, tier three to assess that information? Well, you keep going as far as you can uh, in term, until you don't have the data resolution. But yeah, it's sort of a daisy chain uh, all, all, the way, all the way up. So at some point you have to draw the line just because you don't have the, the resources and data to do that that valuation. Yeah, so it's not a, not a complete picture yet. So what some what are some best practices that you can prescribe to us for achieving carbon neutrality and zero net zero emissions? Well, I wrote down a, a few best practices. Um, uh, this is for organizations who really want to move towards decarbonization. So it's based on some of the things that that we've seen as we work with customers who. Um, want to take this journey. Okay. Uh, so the first thing I would say is, you know, this is just not something that corporations kind of sort of do on the side. It really has to be incorporated into the culture, into the values. Uh, employees need to get involved. It needs to be part of the DNA of the organization. So that's that's the first step. This isn't just a side project. Uh, the second I would say is, and this is what we've been talking about, which is know where you are on the journey today. Be able to, to measure have a baseline, include everything, scope one, two, or three, get a real uh, picture of what the current snapshot is. The third, and this is important, is there's a lot of low-hanging fruit out there, um, energy efficiency projects, optimization projects, um, um, some renewable energy projects. There are projects that most organizations can do to dramatically reduce their carbon footprint up to 30% right now uh, that return a positive ROI. So start there first, do the easy stuff first. Uh, mm -hmm. The other piece is you can't really go it alone. These organizations can't execute across the sustainability value chain on their own. So they really need to build a partner ecosystem. Uh, that's consultancies, but it's also organizations that can actually implement projects. Um, and then the, the last one I would say is you need to be patient, keep your eye on the prize. Um, uh, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, it's going to take multiple years uh, to make progress in terms of decarbonization. So patience is the key. Would you say that companies essentially have no choice but to go in this direction, given the fact that there might be more regulations coming out about disclosing carbon emissions in the supply chains of public companies and maybe even private ones? Yeah, I mean, they're going to have to embark upon the journey. Um, there's increasing pressure all around. It's not just disclosure, but, you know, investors are pressuring organizations 
there's pressure from different parts of the supply chain. Um, customers uh, are pressuring organizations to do something, and there's a lot of brand value associ associated with it. So, yeah, they're, they're, uh, there's somewhere on the journey, whether they like it or not, uh, how successful and how quickly they navigate that is going to be up to them. Yeah. And, of course, we could argue that consumers are becoming more aware all the time, and there is brand Brand risk if you're not up to snuff with consumer expectations. But in any case, uh, Brandon Owens of Insight Sourcing Group, uh, great advice and great perceptions about what's going on in the ESG world and supply chains. Thanks so much for your time. I appreciate your insights. Thank you. Appreciate being on the show.